Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so um, we are going to be looking at uh, the 64 principles. So yesterday we discussed the journey of the jiva, um, the idea that we need to, to really make that proper journey, that proper progress to our ultimate destination. And today we're going to look at how this is done. And again, with a mood of consideration as to how we can take this very uh, lofty teaching, this fully transcendental teaching, and how we can ground it in the reality of our lives. One of the things that many of us would have experienced in 2020 was that we have this disconnect. Sometimes we are individuals who know so much, but sometimes act so poorly. Uh, there's a statement in the Shastra, um, uh, Apina Pasiti. There are those who see, but do not see. Pasyana Apina Pasiti. And oftentimes that is us. We, we have heard, we, we have a certain understanding, but we've not really understood it enough to really imbibe and to live this in our day-to-day -day life. And of course, the understanding is that what we are living, that is actually what we have realized because everything has its symptoms. Okay, so this is, this is principle number one by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sajvali Thakur in his 64 principles. What I will do, I think today, is I'll begin by reading both principles that we're gonna to discuss together because the two are naturally inter intertwined. Then we can have some discussion on this point. So this is principle number one. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction in Shikshashtikam, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam is the only motto of the Gaudiya Math. I'll repeat this. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction in Shikshashtikam, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam is the only motto of the Gaudiya Math. And I'll go now to principle number 51. Okay, yes. And I'll just read this because it relates to the same point. Principle number 51. We should never display any kind of aversion towards Sankirtan Yajna, which is the perfect sacrifice, complete with the seven forms of sacrifice. If we have gradually increased, if we have gradually increasing love for that, then everything will be accomplished and we will attain ultimate perfection. Just preach the words of Rupa and Raghunath with enthusiasm and courage, with complete dedication to the followers of Sri Rupa. I'll read this one more time. We should never display any kind of aversion towards Sankirtan Yajna, which is the perfect sacrifice, complete with the seven forms of sacrifice. If we have gradually increasing love for that, then everything will be accomplished and we will attain ultimate perfection. Just preach the words of Rupa and Raghunath with enthusiasm and courage, with complete dedication to the followers of Sri Rupa. So this idea, <clears throat> Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam, <clears throat> Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, and this is the beginning of those 64 principles. He starts here. He says, this should be the only motto of the Gaudiya Mat. Now, taking into account that he's speaking here about the 64 principles of community, there's a lot that we can, we can discuss and derive from this statement. Every one of us, every one of us consciously and, and much more unconsciously, we all have a conception of happiness. We all have our own idea of what will truly make us happy. And that idea extends in two different arenas. We have our material idea of what will make us happy. 
but we also within the within the realm of devotional service we also have our idea of the type or the way of devotional lifestyle that will make us happy okay so in two in two senses a material conception but we could also call one a spiritual conception which relates to how we situate ourselves in devotional service how we intend to <clears throat> progress in devotional service and how we tend to interact in the devotional journey and that journey in one sense is a journey that we move into to some extent with a certain level of of blindness actually because the actual progress in spiritual life is a revelation what is actually happening is that every time we make some step in Krishna consciousness, as this very wonderful saying, I think I heard this from um, Sachinanda Maharaj. He says, as you walk the path, the path reveals itself to us. And it truly is like that. It, it truly is like that, that the entire journey, along with guidance, which is essential, along with hearing, hearing our teachings, hearing the holy name which is essential along with all of these things because we're dealing we're dealing not so much with a journey we're really dealing with a relationship and what is that relationship it is a relationship of krishna walking us back to his home so the entire process unfolds and it unfolds according ultimately to consciousness and to grace as we walk the path, more and more becomes revealed. There was, um, there was a debate I was listening to, and um, it was a religionist. I think he was a Christian, and he was debating, yes, and he was debating an atheist. And their proposition is, is religion, um, a, is, is religion a means of peace or war? And the argument from the atheist was that, you know, if you look in many different religious traditions, you'll find statements which are directly relating to fighting, to war, etc. And in a sense, we're no different. Our main book, the Bhagavad Gita, takes place on the battlefield. The Battle of Kurukshetra, where literally millions of people lost their lives. And interestingly enough, the, the key instigator for the war is none other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, who's telling Arjuna, you see these people on the other side of the battlefield, I want you to kill them. Not only is, he, is Krishna telling him to kill them, he's saying to him, you should kill them, don't worry, I've already killed them, but I want you to be the instrument through which my will is achieved. So to the lay person, to the person who does not have proper understanding, this seems very, very harsh. And it's not just, uh, it's not, we couldn't even just say it's a prophet or a messenger who's pulling this idea forward. It's actually the supreme personality of Godhead himself. So as these people are arguing back and forwards about is religion a, a catalyst for good in society or a cause of war? I had some realization that there was something that was missing from the equation. So one, so the, the Christian was talking about how, as you look into the tradition, as you look into the teachings, you know, you can see that people, what people actually take from the scripture practically are things which become an impetus to do good in society. And yes, maybe historically one or two people or some people have used religion as a means to engage in warfare, but that's that's atypical. And then the other people, the other person, the atheist will say, no, 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 if you look at it, you know, um, the rich man is in his castle, the poor man in his gate, whatever it is, you know, references to different behaviors that we now consider to be um, unfair, unjust. These are directly in our, in our literatures and therefore in, in religious literatures. And therefore religion is actually a cause of war and conflict and we will do better without religion 
And what I, what I understood, what was missing from both sides of the equation in their discussion was the matter of consciousness. And this is really essential for us to understand in our, in our ability to awaken auspiciousness. We're speaking about this Parambhajayate Sri Krishna Sankirtan, this motto, the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur should, says it should be the only motto. So what happens in terms of consciousness? Where does this come in? As we engage in our teaching, and our teaching can be said to be encapsulated in the Sri Krishna Sankirtan, I mean, the, um, in the glorification of the Holy Name, encapsulated in the Shikshashtakam prayers. We come to understand more and more that consciousness is everything. Why? Because as we engage in our scripture properly, as we engage in our hearing properly, we do not remain the same individual. Every time we engage properly with different elements of devotional service, by engaging with those elements, whether it's a class, whether it's a scripture, whether it's a pure devotee, something changes within us. So the religionist was talking about the scripture, but what he wasn't talking about was the transformation that takes place in contact with the scripture or the transformation that takes place in contact with the sadhu. And that, that relationship is symbiotic because what I mean by symbiotic is that I first come in touch with the teaching or let's say the holy name or let's say that um, a pure devotee. Now, by that contact, I change. And now that I'm different, I then come again in contact with the same element, with the scripture, with the holy name, with the pure devotee. But I come into contact with them again a second time, a different individual. So there is, there is a natural exchange. There's a natural exchange between us and literally every single item of devotional service. We, we think, okay, I come before Radha Mada Mohan and I came before the deities yesterday. I will come before the deities tomorrow. But you come before those same deities, a different person. The last time you contacted the deities, they changed us to the extent that we were open, receptive. That presence, that contact, that interaction changed us. And therefore, the next day that we came before them, we came before them a different person. And the relationship was also different. So this is called iterative. Every time I interact with any aspect of devotional service, to the extent that it is done sincerely and receptively, I come before them a different person. And that transformation of consciousness means that the next time I come before them, I see them differently. We've all had this experience. We've all had the experience whereby over time, when we read the same verse, the same purport, the same pastime in the scripture, we come to that pastime, but suddenly we look at it and we see something different. Something that was not apparent, that was not perceived by us before. Now, when we're looking at what we think is the same thing, we see something different. But why? Because of this cheto dharpana marjanam. Because our contact in Krishna consciousness is transformative, if it's done properly. And that transformation of consciousness means that when I come across the landscape of the teachings, certain things are coming forward, certain things are being revealed to me because the literature itself is non-different from the Lord. The sadhus are representatives of the Lord and the holy name is non-different from the Lord. So there is a journey. There is a journey from the moment we come to the devotional um, arena or the devotional culture. There is a journey where we are being led by the hand, by the Lord, back to the realm 
of transcendence in the realm of ecstasy. So I become different. So in any debate about religion versus atheism, what there isn't, what there isn't a sufficient understanding of, of is how religion transforms the individual. And if the individual is transformed properly, then what happens? Not only do they see their own tradition properly, they see everything properly. This Chaito Dharpana Marjanam, the cleansing of the mirror of the mind, allows us to actually see reality. I see everything. I not only see the scripture in its proper, in its proper perspective, but I also see myself in my proper perspective. And ultimately, and ultimately, as we purify the consciousness, we will see ourselves and we will see our, we will see ourselves distinctly as a pure and specific individual, a specific servant of the servant of the, of the Supreme Lord in Vrindavan. So this, this cleansing process, it, it causes us, if it's done properly, to see everything in its proper perspective. And Krishna alludes to this in the Bhagavad Gita. Right? So he says that when, when one comes to the mode of goodness, he says all the gates of the body are illuminated by knowledge. Uh, and Prabhupada in the purple will explain how that blessing allows us to see things in their proper perspective. So it is essential that we engage in the process, but we engage in the process in the proper perspective. Now, what do I mean by perspective? For example, when I go to see a doctor, if I have a health issue, what the doctor will do, they will do a few things. One is that they will diagnose my situation. They will diagnose, okay, this is the situation you're in. This is your state of health. We can say that this is some bunda, okay? The, the, the reality of the situation. They will also implicitly understand what good health looks like. Okay, so that is the goal, okay? So we know where you are. We know where we want to get you to. We want, we want to get you to this proper state of health. That is the priogena, the goal. And they will then be able to administer. It's not just the administration of medicine, but it's the administration of medicine applied properly for my situation. Okay. So because your health is like this, and because good health looks like that, I need you to take this particular prescription. And to take this particular prescription, this much, these, these many doses a day, to take it at this time of the day, you know, with water, after a meal, whatever it is. So they will then give a particular treatment. That treatment, that is the Abideya. Okay, so we've understood your situation. You didn't understand your situation, right? I'm ill. I, I, all I know is that there's something wrong. I know that there's something wrong. I don't understand exactly what's going on. I need some guidance to diagnose properly what is the situation and what good health looks like. So along with that journey, that journey where Krishna is bringing us back to the spiritual world, Krishna never comes alone and he does not act alone. So we're looking for the guidance of those who can perceive more clearly than we can what the situation is and that is sadhu that is guru that is shastra so when we are looking at the instructions for example bhakti siddhanta we understand that they have a different perception to us and again we've all seen this to some extent because if we've engaged in the process properly over time because of the Chaito Dharpana Majnam, when we look out into the world, we can see more. We can see things differently. And that perception is priceless. Because we navigate the world effectively to the degree that we can actually see things clearly 
and in their proper relationship to other things. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur in this first statement is giving us the first, the first foundation of seeing the world properly. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction in Shikshashtakam, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam is the only motto of the Gaudiya Mat. What does that mean? The only motto. If you, if you want to create community, there has to be, there has to be an understanding that the members of the community have and that understanding that the members of the community have has to be an understanding which completely maps to, to the truth. What do I mean by this? So in the modern world, there's a huge push for diversity, okay? Huge push. And the idea is that we, we want to honor the differences. Okay, so when we make the endeavor to honor the differences, then to the extent that we do it based upon truth. In other words, to the extent that I honor the genuine differences between us, it will have some longevity. What do I mean by longevity? Every time we do something in the mode of goodness, because we know that the mode of goodness is ruled by Vishnu who maintains. We know the mode of goodness is also related to Dharma. And what does Dharma mean? Dharma means that which sustains. To the extent that we do something in goodness, we're doing it in truth. In other words, we're acting according to the reality of a situation. If I, if I, properly, if I properly diagnose a situation and act accordingly, over the long term, I will always have far better outcomes than if I deny a reality. Because if I deny a reality, I bring, I contaminate myself with the mode of ignorance. And the mode of ignorance leads to destruction. So by, by holding on to a false conception of life, by holding on to a false conception of who I am, and by holding on to a false conception of who other people are, that is the first critical mistake. Now that I don't see the person properly, I don't relate to the person properly, therefore the relationship will go down. The converse is also true. If I recognize where there are genuine differences and I honor those differences in a healthy way, then what happens is I've just created a way of interacting with other people which will lead to a sustainable relationship. We, we often engage in different services. And I was in communication with, um, with some devotees around one project that we're doing. And um, I, actually, let's give a better example. I was on a call and um, someone was asking me about devotional projects in ISKCON. And I was explaining that when I do different services, I, I try to consider a few critical things. One of the things I consider is competence. See, because we can do a service, we can get people involved in the service, we may do it very blindly. So we need something done and I like this devotee. So with no consideration of what I need done, no consideration of what they can actually do, I just say, well, that devotee is a nice person, let me get them involved. Yeah, we need you to do this. And I was explaining that when we engage in services, we should look at the reality, competence. What, what can this person actually do? What is their actual competency? What is their actual skill set? And then if I have understood that, if, if I've looked at the truth of what they can actually do, and then I match what they can actually do to a need that the project actually has, now something is happening. Now they can consistently perform according to what the project needs. They're going to be happy because they're using a, a real competence that they have, which they're motivated to offer. And the people in the project will be happy because this person is now able to complete something that the project needs. So therefore everything can be sustained. 
what often happens in our movement is we will not regard anything, which actually means we're being affected by the mode of ignorance. Now, and, and they, in the secular world, they call it trying to get a square peg in the round hole. So someone who cannot do that particular job, now we're getting them in and they're failing. Now they're failing to do that particular service. Everyone is getting frustrated with them. Now they feel that everyone is frustrated with me, but I'm trying so hard, I'm doing my best. Like, wh why don't these devotees just understand how sincere I am? So they're unhappy, everyone else is unhappy because we did not start by looking at the reality. So people have diverse competencies, but it doesn't stop there. That is one aspect of reality, that there is diversity. But there is another aspect of reality where we all know that there are certain fundamental needs that we have as living entities and as servants of Krishna, specifically. So the other aspect of reality is that we are unified. We have certain commonalities. So what is reality? If I recognize diversity and unity, as Prabhupada says, unity with diversity, if I recognize and honor both of these properly, then I have the foundations for a sustainable community. It's so interesting. As I traveled around the world in our movement, th there's a science called Nimitagyan. Um, this is mentioned in our, in our scriptures. So for example, um, when Duryodhana was born, it is mentioned in first canto Bhagavatam, that Vidura told Drishtarastra, he said, why don't you kill this son, this son of yours? And, and Vidura went on to explain all of these omens. So first canto it describes, you know, there were all kinds of natural disasters, storms, hurricanes, etc. And for those who know this science, uh, yeah, Nimitagyan, this science of omens, they could understand by the omens, this means that someone extremely demoniac has just taken birth. So Vidura understood this science. So he actually said that to, um, to Krishna. And actually that Nimitagyan is one of the 64 arts that Krishna and Balaram learn in the, um, in the Gurukul of Sandipani Muni. These are listed in Krishna book. So Vidura, understanding these omens, he says to um, Jutrasta, why don't you kill this son of yours? He said, all of these indicators indicate that this person will be the cause of the destruction of your dynasty. So he understood the omens. In the, in the 12th canto, Bhagavatam, Yud, um, Uddhava also, he knows this, also, this science also. He sees all these inauspicious omens and he's, 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 he's fearful. The inauspicious omens indicate that something negative must be about to happen, something highly inauspicious. And so um, Uddhava, who's extremely brilliant, extremely trained, he, he then ponders, what is the most inauspicious thing that could happen? And he's, he realizes, heartbreakingly, the most inauspicious thing that can happen is that Krishna is about to leave the world. And he confronts Krishna who, who confirms, yes, I'm now, I'm now going to wind up my earthly pastimes. So there's a science of omens. There's a science of, they call it nimitta, where you can understand something by its symptoms. And this point is also made by um, Narada Muni. Proktam. Something can be understood by its symptoms. So as I traveled around the world to see different devotee communities, I could see that those communities which properly honored unity with diversity, you could see that they were the more functional communities. They could function because they were living according to reality. They recognized, yes, unity is an aspect of reality. Diversity is an aspect of reality. So if we honor both of these things in their proper balance, then things will keep going. Things will not only sustain. Dharma means Dharma means that which sustains, but it but it also means some, something which expands. How do I explain this? It's like this: if you if you're able to maintain something in a healthy way, then by definition it will build upon itself and it will be a lasting build. The mode of passion builds something up only to cause it to crash later on. 
the mode of goodness, it builds something in a way which is sustainable. In other words, it's like this. You, you look after your money carefully. So you have a job, you're earning a certain amount of money, you build, you look after that money carefully. So you're receiving some money, you invest it. So the money, first of all, now it stays. But now because it's there and it's being invested, you're getting interest on your money. So it's, it builds upon itself to become more money. Now, that higher amount of money is now solid, it's sustained, but it builds upon itself to become more money. So when Dharma is present, when we do things properly in the mode of goodness, they are sustainable. They sustain and they also build upon themselves. So there is a need. There is a need to do things according to Dharma. It is so heartbreaking to see the devotees in our movement struggle. And the number one reason why they struggle is not the teaching. The number one reason why the devotees in our community struggle is because of a misapplication of the teachings. And that misapplication is very dangerous because when we misapply the teaching, along with not understanding the teaching properly, along with thinking that I've understood it properly, then it leads to a certain conclusion. So now, I, I think I've understood Krishna consciousness, but I haven't. Therefore, I've misunderstood it, but I think I've understood it properly. Therefore, I misapply it. Now, because I'm misapplying it, I'm having all kinds of difficulties and challenges. So when I hit these difficult and difficulties and challenges, because I think I know the philosophy and I know how to apply the philosophy, my natural conclusion is there must be something wrong with this philosophy. Or my natural conclusion is this philosophy is just, it's just inherently difficult. It never occurs to me, no, the philosophy is amazing and incredible, but you don't know how to apply the philosophy properly. And that is, that is an issue. It is, it is a pandemic that runs through practically, well, the majority of our communities. The majority of our communities. So, it's, so that misperception of the philosophy leads to the misapplication and therefore it leads to difficulties, more difficulties than we are meant to have. The, the, the way that Prabhupada envisioned Krishna consciousness, the way that Krishna gave us Krishna consciousness, for many of us, because of the misapplication, it's far more of a struggle than it was actually meant to be. And it's because we don't apply it properly according to our time, place, and personality. So back to this point, I saw through these different communities that when the philosophy was applied properly, those communities were thriving. The relationships were thriving. And along with the challenges, because, it, because undoubtedly there must be challenges, just like there must be an exam to pass an exam. Even with the challenges, those challenges weren't a cause of fear or, or, um, or difficulty or burden. Those challenges were incredibly exciting. It's just like when you've, when you've studied properly, you've studied hard, you've, you've tried to really learn the subject matter. When you hit the tests, you're like, bring it on, bring it on. I can't wait to sit this paper, right? I, I, know, the, I know I've studied properly for this. I know what's, I, I, I know the subject and that's how we're meant to be. Yeah. This, this process is meant to be joyfully performed yeah. with enthusiasm, yeah. great enthusiasm. Utsahan. But we often fail because of the misapplication. And there's a clue in this statement by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur about how we can apply it differently. So, Parambhijate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam is the only motto of the Gordian Mat. That means there must be unity with diversity. The only motto means that shared sense of purpose that everyone can align to. The only motto. We are diverse, so there's diversity. We recognize, we know in our tradition, there's diverse natures, right? We know that there's differences between the Brahmana nature, the Kshatriya nature, the Vaishya nature, the Shudra nature. We also know that none of them are better than any other. Every one of them are equally useful, equally good. 
So we recognize the unity. If I deny that, what happens? I try to make everyone the same as me. And because they're not the same as me, but I try to force them to be like me, it then leads to repression, which then leads to resentment, and then leads to the uh, breakup of the relationships. We see this a lot also in Iskun. I'm trying to make someone something that they are not, rather than trying to allow them to engage who they are in devotional service to Krishna. So I saw that those communities that actually honored the differences, and let's be very clear, honoring the differences doesn't mean it's an excuse for us not rolling up our sleeves and doing whatever is required when it's required. But it means that whenever possible, we should, off, we should engage our talents, capabilities, so that we can always grow with enthusiasm. And that enthusiasm isn't a small thing, by the way. There is a subtle thing that happens in our exchanges with one another. As we, as we relate to one another properly, the energy and the enthusiasm and the devotion that you carry spills over. When we, when we, when we associate with pure devotees, there is an aura contact. Even, even if they do not say anything, just the fact that we are in their presence, the devotion that they carry in their consciousness, that, which is infusing or surcharging their subtle body. By that association, we are purified by that energy and that association, even if they do not say a single word. So the enthusiasm, the devotion, the learning, the insight, the maturation that we carry in our consciousness is what we are bringing into the environment. And it is, it is the primary thing that we are gifting towards others in association. The gift is consciousness. So this unity of diversity, a shared sense of purpose, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam. This, this extraordinary, powerful and auspicious statement. All glories to the Sri Krishna Sankirtan. That means we all come together recognizing the diversity, but also honoring the unity. Yes, we are different. We come from different backgrounds. We have different mentalities. But what unites us all is this Sankirtan mission. Sankirtan. Uh, san, that prefix, is, is, is all around that collective engagement, the collective engagement of people and the collective engagement of the material energy. Meaning what? It means that literally all the artifacts in the world, everything belongs to Krishna and therefore everything is meant to be utilized for Krishna. Every element belongs to Krishna Every mentality also belongs to Krishna. So when I was giving class in, in Mayapur, I think it was, it was either last year or this year. Anyway, at the beginning of the year, we were talking about this, how when you have a society which honors everyone's service properly, when, when we do this in our movement, you'll see our movement will explode. We are in a position, if we do this properly, to, to be at least at least 50 to 100 times more successful in spreading the Sankirtan mission, even with less effort. Why and how? It has to do with the proper engagement of unity with diversity. What the devotees pick up, unfortunately, in many of our communities, we say that the <laughs> Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita talks about this samadarshana, this equal vision. So we say, that every living entity is equal in, in Krishna's eyes. What it should mean is also every devotee, every service that one renders is equal. But what we're doing subtly in many cases is we're actually saying that this, uh, this service and therefore this person or these people, they're more important than these other people. And that, that begins to create the issue because we're not, and this is, this is because we don't see properly, therefore we don't behave properly. Our job is to value all services equally because they all come into this Sankirtan Yajna. 
So the analogy that's given is like an army. You do have some people on the front line. Okay, but how are they able to function on the front line? They have weapons. Someone else created the weapons. They have, they have supplies. They have food, water. Someone else made the food and water and put that together. They have military intelligence. Someone else is collecting that military intelligence. So if we recognize and value everyone's service, what happens? There's studies. So in my, in my role, we teach my day-to-day -day occupation. We teach leadership. And I mean, we quote studies like this all the time. There, there's a study by an organization called Gallup. And they found that in an organization where you just focus on what people are not good at and you try to change them, then the engagement in the organization goes up by 10 to 11 percent. But they did a, they done this study. They've replicated, that, I think, with millions of people around the world, different cultures. They found in organizations where you engage people according to their talents and you appreciate those diverse talents, the engagement goes up by over 70 percent. That means that translates to a, a movement of devotees who they're so enthusiastic to do what they can do to spread the mission. Engagement goes up by over 70%. Instead of having devotees who feel unappreciated and therefore back off, in fact, you have everyone feeling tremendously appreciated and they are going above and beyond what they have to do. They're doing extra because they're so incredibly enthusiastic to give and serve. And that is the power of love. That is the power of proper unity with diversity. So if there's just diversity, we, we won't have even a community. We won't have a community. So if in the modern society, if I just talk about how everyone is different and I've got my thing, my group, it won't work. It will be the cause of destruction. It will break things down because that's not the full picture of reality. So it, it's what I, saw in, what I saw in my own life and in the life of other people, this, this idea of Dharma is incredible. Not that it's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is Sanatana Dharma. But until we are fully on the transcendental platform, we're meant to use Dharma for Sanatana Dharma. In other words, we stand on Dharma while we engage in the practice of Sanatana Dharma. So this idea of unity with diversity, I recognize the differences and I recognize the similarities and we give credence to both. If I just recognize diversity, I will break up the relationships. I'm different to you. I've got my own thing with my own group. We're not the same. You're different from us. I'm different from you. If it's just about diversity, it can cause the bonds of unity to break. If it's just about unity, without recognizing and honoring the differences, we also have a problem. Yeah. What, what happens again, like you said, when you try to make everyone the same, everyone's the same. There's no differences at all. You should all be good at the same thing. You should all act the same way. You should all think the same way. Then again, because it's out of sync with, with Dharma, it's, like it's going against the reality. To the extent that we go against the truth, to that extent, we make our life difficult. I, I found this um, wonderful statement in Niti Shastra by Chanakya. Chanaka is just so brilliant. I mean, he says, everything unnatural is an enemy. So simple, so terse, so direct, so concise. Everything unnatural is an enemy. In other words, the more unnatural we are, the more unnaturally we live, the more we create problems in our life. And those problems aren't so obvious. The problems aren't so obvious. They, 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 because we're going against the mode of goodness, we're going against Dharma, then what happens is you see the results over time. So just like Dharma sustains and builds up over time, our Dharma degrades over time. We, we're not so, we're not so, um, we're not so unalert to the mode of ignorance because you could see something sometimes that's completely destructive. Where we fall down is the mode of passion because it looks good, in the short term, but it creates the issues in the mid to long term. So we mentioned this yesterday, which I think really sums it up nicely. Hard choices, easy life. Difficult choices, hard life. 
What does this mean? It maps to the statement by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Mode of goodness begins like poison, but in the long term is like nectar. So doing the right thing, even when it's difficult, even when it's difficult, knowing that actually if I do what I'm meant to do, even if it's a bit difficult, even if sometimes it's not always understood, it will lead to so many auspicious outcomes in the long term. This is what we're meant to be doing. But there has to be that unity of diversity. We have to understand the common goal. So we honor the differences. When we see someone doing different services, we don't think that my service is right, all this other stuff, this is just, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a book distributor, baby. Don't you understand? You know, I'm doing the real service. This is what Prabhupada said. You guys, yeah, yeah, you know, cooking, yeah, yeah it's not bad. I, I, was, I, was, I was at a retreat. And, and, and I saw something which, it made my heart stop. I'll be honest, it made my heart stop. And when I saw it, I thought, this is something we have to, we have to really, we have to weed this out. There was, a, there was a mother, part of our community. And uh, so we were at this retreat and, and she made some statement about how she's just looking after the children. And, and it was like, when I, when I heard the statement, my heart stopped because I realized immediately, no, if she thinks this, if she thinks, that, that bringing up the children is some kind of, yeah, it's, you know, it's nice, but it's not really, it's, it's all secondary. If she thinks that her service is less important, then no wonder she's not going to do it, or she will do it. But there'll be so many who think, you know what, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really going to put much energy because after all, it's not really important. And so when I spoke, I, I, I mentioned the point, this is an incredible service. It's, it's an incredible service. And, and, I, and I realized, I thought to myself, okay, so what, what has caused that? What are, what are the overt statements? And more, more insidiously, what are the subtle behaviors? They call these um, micro inequities. Micro inequities are small behaviors that we may do that kind of put down the importance of something or someone. Yeah, you know, yeah, what's your service? Oh, and I'm trying to really bring up the children Christian. Oh, oh. Oh really? Oh, oh, interesting. And and what's 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 the real service that you're doing? So small behaviors that communicate to to the other person. Your what you do is not really important. What you do is less important than what I'm doing. And these things are picked up, and over time they start to erode. They start to erode the culture. And what they do is they um they distort our communities. How do they distort the communities? If I don't feel that what this person is doing is valuable and I communicate that directly and indirectly and they unfortunately believe, believe me, they start to pick it up unconsciously, actually what I'm doing is less valuable, then they'll put less energy into that service. They will not do it so well. We, we in our communities, we need one another because Dharma is not just that it sustains itself, Dharma sustains the, the dharma of others if if what if the people who are good at getting resources if they do their job properly those resources then become available to the entire society if the people who are good at education if they do their job properly their their teaching their education empowers everyone else by giving out what everyone else clear vision upon which they can do their service if the people who are good at leading and managing, if they do their job properly, their expert management and organization makes everything run smoothly for the benefit of everyone else. If the people who are good at assisting do their job properly, then it creates a huge workforce which allows a huge execution. In other words, everyone depends upon everyone else. So the moment that I undermine someone else's service, I'm actually undermining my own service because there's an interconnection, an interrelationship, ultimately an interdependence, you see? An interdependence, just like the body. One part of the body is interdependent upon another part of the body. So the more I honor and encourage what one group are doing properly, that I recognize that diversity of skill, that diversity of service, while also recognizing that we all have a common connection, when I do that, then the, then the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So Param Vijayate, 
Shri Krishna Sankirtan, Sankir, real Sankirtan Yajna. But it requires a certain maturity of me. It requires enough maturity that I'm no longer in that immature state where I want to be, the, I want to be above other people, which is actually a form of insecurity. And because of that, I'm actually now, dis I'm actually disabling other people's service or denigrating other people's service, undermining other people's service. And of course, what Krishna will do, if I do that, there'll be, there'll be subtle and gross repercussions. What happens subtly, every time I act in the mode of ignorance or passion, well, I, the first thing I do is I contaminate my consciousness. Again, going back to that, that chain, first of all, I'm now becoming blinded. I've acted in the mode of passion or I've acted in the mode of ignorance. So I've blinded my own capacity. I, I've reversed this Cheto Dapana Marginum. The very process of cleaning the heart, I'm now reversing it. I'm unwinding it by now contaminating myself with ignorance and passion. Every time I do something Adamic in devotional service, every time I insult someone, every time I undermine someone, I insult and undermine myself. I've now made my own devotional path harder. So now there's some covering that's come. Now, that, that instrument by which we navigate the world is the same instrument by which we navigate Krishna consciousness. What is it? Consciousness. Cheto Dapana Marjanam. So now I've, I've assisted my own Maya. How? Because Maya has two potencies. First of all, she covers the living entity. And having covered the living entity, she can then pull them down. So when I, when I engage in covering my own consciousness, now the very environment that previously I was able to maneuver through so expertly, so expertly, now because of the covering, I can't see the environment properly. And that is the precursor to making a mistake, a misstep. I can't see where I am. I can't see where I'm going. And because I can't see where I am, I can't see where I'm going. I, I make the wrong step. And that step now starts to lead to some kind of other difficulty or struggle. So, so we could have a campaign in ISCO. And the campaign could be protect your consciousness. I, and it's, it's, it's not a criticism. I, I get it. For many devotees, we haven't had the teachings explained to us in a way that we understand. No, when Krishna, this is a person who loves you so much. When he says, don't do it, he's not saying don't do it because just because if you do it, then I'm going to be upset. I'm going to be annoyed. When Krishna gives an instruction, when Prabhupada, when every Acharya gives an instruction, they have, they have so much love, such intense compassion and such intense selflessness that every single instruction that you will find in Krishna consciousness, every single syllable of every single word is a deep, a deep compassionate offering for our well-being. In other words, when you hear an instruction in Krishna consciousness, if it's given properly by a pure source, that instruction is solely for our own benefit. And you can see by the behavior of the devotees, how many of us, we don't really understand that. So, so many times, so many things that we're, that we're given in our teachings, we ask, you know, why do I need to do that? You know, yeah, Prabhupada said, yeah, but you know, I don't need to follow that. We, we think it's almost like we're, it's an imposition that, that we're being forced to do something and it's for someone else's benefit. No, if it's a proper instruction given by a pure source and you follow it, you benefit. This is how we awaken auspiciousness. This Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtan, the only motto, that means the shared sense of purpose. Rec and, 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 it, and actually, when you unfold it, it implies both unity and diversity. Shared sense of purpose meaning we all have one goal. Param, it is the topmost, right? All glories to the Shri Krishna Sankirtan movement. It is the topmost thing. So the unity land lies above us while we recognize and cooperate together on the plane of diversity. And the diversity is implied, Sankirtan. That means diverse Kirtan. It means everything, everyone, all the diverse elements in the world being engaged in this unified purpose. 
yeah, the motto. And even more on a deeper level, Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtan, it is recognizing not only Krishna, Shri, Shri Krishna Sankirtan. Prabhupada was, was, um, was, was questioned by one devotee. And the devotee was talking about how, you know, Krishna is always with um, Radharani. And, and, they, and they, they said, but Prabhupada, you know, but, you know, but we, also, we also hear about the um, Bhad of Kukshetra and Krishna's there and so on. And Prabhupada made an interesting statement. But even on the battlefield through the Kurukshetra, Radharani's presence would have been there in some way. He said, do you think that Krishna can be anywhere without Shumati Radharani? So when we hear Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtan, that Shri, that female potency, Shri, Shri in that sense, in that particular statement, Shri means Radharani. Shri Krishna Sankirtanam, Radhe, Radha Krishna Sankirtanam. Hare Krishna Sankirtana. That is what it, it actually means. It is the complete kirtan, the energy of the Lord and the Lord coming together in that loving exchange and glorification. So these are just some considerations about these very, very deep understanding. And I'll just share one more before we go to questions. So it said, all glories to the Sri Krishna Sankirtan. This, this understanding is actually the understanding of true happiness. Everyone, we have this, we said at the beginning, everyone has a map of their idea of what will make me happy. And, and we act upon that consciously or unconsciously. So Parambhijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtan is actually saying that all glories to Krishna, to Sri Sri Radha, Shamasunda. Why? Because in their glorification, their glorification is actually your glorification, is our glorification. Their happiness is actually our happiness. In other words, when we water the root, when we give all glories, all respect, all service to Sri Sri Radha and Krishna, they're, they're being pleased is actually the fullness of our own satisfaction. So Prabhupada was asked, how do you know that Krishna is pleased? And on a number of occasions, Prabhupada's answer is that you'll know that Krishna is pleased when the spiritual master is pleased. There was, a, there was an occasion where Keshava Bharti Maharaj, he asked the same question to Prabhupada. And he said, so he said, Prabhupada, you know, how, how do you know when Krishna is pleased? And Prabhupada gave a very interesting, a very insightful and very different answer. So he told Keshava Bharati Maharaj, he said, you'll know that Krishna is pleased when you're satisfied. It's a very brilliant answer. Mamai Vamso, Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. Manashishtani Nindriyani, Prakriti Shtani Kashati. Mama Eva Amsa. Mama means my, Eva means certainly, Amsa. Amsa means part and parcel. Krishna is saying in the Bhagavad Gita, everyone, every living entity is part and parcel of me. But he goes on to say that they are kashati, right? Kashati means struggling, struggling very hard. What is the cause of our struggle? Uh, mana, mana means the mind. Shastani means six. Indriyani, Indriyani means the senses. Uh, they're struggling very hard with the mind and the senses. So the mind is considered to be the sixth sense. It is the king of all the senses. Therefore, if someone has controlled the mind, they've controlled the senses. Because the mind is the king of all the senses. So these are the struggles. And not only are they the struggles, but they are also the... They are also the misconception of happiness. What does that mean? It means that in our conditioned state, we think that if I, if I gratify my senses, I'll be satisfied. And for the majority of people, life, is, life becomes a bitter, a bitter experience. For the majority of people, life becomes a heartbreaking, bitter and resentful experience. Why? To the extent that I think that matter can make me happy, I will become bitter 
every time I try to engage with matter and find that she will not give me the satisfaction I'm looking for. I tried to enjoy in one way, it didn't work out. I tried to enjoy in another way, it didn't work out. In Vedic society, what was meant to happen is as people grew older, you were meant to see that they become happier, more fulfilled, more joyful because of the spiritual path. What you see often is the opposite. As people get older in the material world now, they just become more disappointed, frustrated, bitter and resentful. And you especially see this in the way sometimes that the elderly deal sometimes with the younger generation. Because as they grew older, their own dreams were broken. Their own, their own, um, their own aspirations for happiness were not fulfilled. And then they're looking at the younger generation feeling upset that this person has all this time, all this energy, all this joy, all this hope. We need to, we need to stamp that out. So that it goes into this kind of bitter space whereas, in the, whereas the opposite is meant to happen. As we engage in devotional service properly, we're meant to become literally more joyful. And that joy is also meant to spill over into the environment. Our consciousness, it deposits itself in the environment. It is a fact. That is why Prabhupada was able to attract people from all different backgrounds. Because it's not just what he said, actually it's who he is. The biggest and most powerful preaching is who we are. The attainment of, of higher consciousness, spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness. If we have that, then wherever we go into the environment, it spills over and it affects people on the most subtle and powerful level. So Prabhupada said to Keshe Ravati, you'll know that Krishna is pleased when you're pleased. This is the true conception of happiness. Because I'm part and parcel of Krishna, when he is pleased, when he is satisfied, I myself will automatically experience a satisfaction that is unparalleled and that, and that cannot be experienced by anything in the material world. Therefore, our only motto, our shared sense of purpose, our unity with diversity, our way of honoring the truth and the goal while appreciating others properly, if I don't appreciate other devotees and their service properly, I'm sabotaging the Sankirtan movement. It, it really is that simple. If I don't value the devotees and their service properly, well, I'm actually saying subtly, don't serve Krishna like that. Don't serve Krishna so well. Don't do your service properly. And it's also a way of putting myself in the center. When I say that my service is, is the best, when I say that my service is the greatest, my service is the real service, what I'm actually saying is I am the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is the exact material disease that got us into the material world in the first place. And therefore as devotees, it is also the, the root anatta, which causes all the other anattas. Why is there envy? Why is there jealousy? Envy and jealousy means that there's two devotees who both think that they're God. And, and, and their competition is to see who can be more God than the other person. And, and that is not the way of satisfaction. So we sabotage the mission. And when we sabotage the mission, what happens is the grace of Prabhupada, which is unlimited, it starts to shrink, not because of Prabhupada, not because of Prabhupada, it starts to shrink because of us. There are two things in spiritual life. There is mercy and there is receptivity. There is unlimited mercy. But what we do if we sabotage our, mich, our mission is we limit our receptivity to that unlimited mercy. Anyway, these are some considerations on the importance of unity, diversity, and how when we do this, we awaken that true auspiciousness, the auspiciousness of true advancement, the auspiciousness of true ecstasy in spiritual life. You don't need to tell someone when you're happy in spiritual life. You don't need to tell someone. You step into the room, people, anyone who's perceptive, they can pick it up. People can feel it. You feel abundance, everyone can, can pick it up. You're actually happy, everyone can pick it up. And your consciousness automatically spills over to, into the environment and it even burns away other people's challenges. Advanced devotees, 
by their own advancement, their advancement, plus our receptivity, minus our tendency to be offensive. These three things together means you can receive so much from that person. I call it the pro formula, P-R-O. So if you remember nothing else, you can remember these three letters, P-R-O. P stands for, stands for pure devotion. So the Bhagavatam, the holy name, the pure sadhus, all carriers of pure devotion. So we want to access that pure devotion, plus R stands for receptivity. So humility, selflessness, service mentality. So pure devotion plus receptivity to that pure devotion. Minus O. Minus the O stands for offenses. Minus those things which actually damage our receptivity, damage our access to pure devotion. So we want to live Krishna consciousness like a pro. Accessing pure devotion, being deeply receptive, humble, unity of diversity, genuine appreciation, minus the tendency to sabotage the movement and sabotage our own progress by making offenses to others. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll open up for any questions. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. We have a few questions. I will already read the one of Tushta Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu writes, thank you so much for your presentation. You said in the majority of our communities, there is lack of proper understanding and application of Krishna consciousness philosophy. If that is the case, I feel it is important for us to recognize what are the most impactful misunderstandings or misapplication so that they can be addressed. What do you say are they? Okay, you can sum it up in one way. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it like this. So what, what's happened in our, in our movement, and Prabhupada did address this, and I'll explain how he addressed this. What's happened in our movement is our aim is transcendence. And, and that is as it should be. That is the goal. That is, that is what we, that is, what we, that is the, the very purpose of human life. So we're all hopefully looking up this goal of transcendence. This is, what, this is what I want to achieve. This is my aim. Where we have sometimes failed to give proper understanding is to our foundations. If I have, if I have a bow and arrow in my hands and I want to aim to hit a target above me, okay? So you can say, okay, what is going to allow me to hit the target effectively? One factor is my steadiness of aim. So it's how expert I am at really taking that bow and arrow, looking at the target, being focused, absolutely. Very, very crucial. But there is also another factor. The other factor, aside from the aim above me, is the quality of my foundation. Is my foundation steady? What am I standing on? Because if I'm standing on a foundation which is very unsteady, then even though I'm, I, I like to think I'm a good archer, I, I'm good at taking focus, even though I'm trying to focus, because my foundation is unsteady, it keeps moving my focus away. So this is the blind spot that many of us have. We're aiming for transcendence, but we don't also stabilize our foundation. It is interesting, there's a, there's a seminar called Prabhupada, our founder, Acharya. And it's a seminar given by a Prabhupada disciple called Sureshwara Prabhu. And he's done something very interesting. And, and I, I heard about this through him. Actually, I first heard about this through Sachinanda Maharaj because he had the notes and he mentioned this, this point. Then I also heard about this from my spiritual master. He gave a seminar on Varnas, the interdependence of the Varnas. And he said something that I never heard before. He, he talked about the same thing that Sureshwar Prabhu explained, but Sureshwar Prabhu explains it in detail. He talked about how Prabhupada made different statements about Varnashram over time. When Prabhupada first came to the West, he explained that this Varnashram, Varnashram could not be instituted in modern society. Now, what happened over time, Prabhupada started to see that the devotees were having trouble really maintaining 
that kind of strong and um, devotional um, advancement. And he saw that what was going on was the, their social situation, that that wasn't so, so stable. It wasn't so established. So, so from going to, from a point of view of saying, you know, we can't actually, um, in, implement Varnashram, over time, he started to give more emphasis to Varnashram. And as he was leaving, he emphasized the importance of Varnashram. Now for Varnashram, read stable lifestyle. And it's, it's that stability is not the same for everyone. And this is another confusion. Some devotees are more renounced than others. Renunciation doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's not that whoever's the most renounced is the most advanced. Don't, let's, let's make that very clear. Some people in their previous lives, they were yogis, they were ascetics. Therefore, they love being, they love being living simply. You know, they, I know one devotee, I won't mention their name, but they love simplicity. I mean, if they could, they'd get rid of everything in their house. They'd have nothing. They, they just love to be minimal, minimalist. But it's actually because of their previous life. They were, they were a renunciate in their previous life. So they, 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 anything that they can get rid of, they will get rid of. In fact, you have to sometimes argue with them. No, we can't throw that out. We want to keep that. Anyway, so the point is that that conditioning can be there. So for some devotees, because of that very detached nature, they may live a certain way. For other people, they may not have that same level of, of renunciation. Therefore, they may need a bit more facility, but facility just so that they can be stable, have a stable material situation so that they can focus on transcendence. That's the point. And that's, that's to encapsulate the misconception is that my material situation has nothing to do with my devotional progress. Not true. Not true. If you're very renounced, then you need less. So you may think, oh, I, I need very, very little. And that may work for that person. But if other people require more facility, for example, because they have a family, then you take the facility you need, but you make sure you use that properly in Krishna consciousness. So the blind side is the social stability. And that social stability, it means, you know, there are some devotees, they, they don't hold down a proper, a proper job. And what's going on is they're disturbed about, you know, whether they're going to pay the bills. There's some devotees that don't look after their health properly. Therefore, they're now their body's falling apart. If you're on a very high stage, Bhaktivinoda Thakur has spoken about this in the Chaitanya Shikshamrita. He says, unless you're a Paramahamsa, good care for the body, good stimulation for the mind, good social situation and good study of the scripture to see how all these things come together. So what we do, unfortunately, sometimes is we act above our own level of advancement. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says a cause of fall down is to act below your level of advancement or to act above your level of advancement. Prabhupada encapsulates it very well. He says, we, we, we read about the great devotees, he said, but we do not imitate. So what that means is we follow according to our level of advancement. It goes back to what we said at the beginning. We have the teachings and then we have the, how the teachings are, how, are applied according to our situation. And, if we do, and, and where you see devotees have difficulty is where they misapply the teachings within the context of their own situation. That's the number one factor. And it takes maturity, it takes guidance, it also takes some consciousness. Sometimes you may apply something and you're seeing the effect of the application. You're seeing, okay, it works now, right? Or you're seeing it doesn't work. So it's also fine tuning how we apply. Fine tuning how we apply Krishna consciousness and making sure that we stand on a steady foundation. In, for example, we want money so we don't have to worry about money. We, we, we want good health so we don't have to worry about it. I wrote to, I wrote to Prahlada Nandamaraj years ago. It may have been even over 10 years ago. And I, I was concerned about the food that we serve in our ISKCON communities. Because, and, and, and to be honest, we should all be, have this mood of thinking, I am my brother and sister's keeper. So I wrote to him. Because he he's the ISKCON Minister for Health. I'm not sure if he's still in that role, but he was at least then. And I said, look, if we, if we, it, it's completely possible to, to serve prashadam that is deliciously tasty. Because people, people, even devotees, they need to feel, they need to have some, some, some enjoyment. 
And if we can give them spiritual enjoyment, that will help them. So it's completely plausible to, to have food served in our devotional communities, which are tasty, but also healthy. What we don't want to see is devotees, and you can see that they're having health issues, and, it's because, and you can see the seed of it. If you know this, um, what's the word? Nimitagyan. It's just, it's just a way of looking at the modes. All of these foods are in the mode of passion and ignorance. Therefore, these communities of devotees who are constantly eating food in the modes of passion and ignorance, in the future, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a mind reader or, or, or some kind of psychic. In the future, they're all going to have issues with their health. All of them. You know, they're overeating, they don't do any exercise, and all the food is very, very rich and unhealthy, and it doesn't need to be. So we could, so we could just tweak that one thing. And the ramifications, the ramifications are huge. So this is where we're going wrong. It's, we're not looking at the foundation that we are standing on while we're aiming at transcendence. We're thinking, I can live anywhere I like, but I'll just become pure. No, it doesn't work that way. And we know that doesn't work that way because even in the material world where people often live any way they like, they're having so many challenges. Even now this year with the coronavirus, if we, if we had a much more healthy community, there would have been less issues. Right? If we had a more healthy community, set of communities, there'll be less issues in our community. Why? Because the immune system would be stronger. Right? So we'd be, in a, we'd be in, a better, in a better state to deal with any challenges. We have both a physical immune system. We also have a spiritual immune system. So it's our foundations that we need to be more mindful of. Small things make a huge difference. There's studies which have been done on this topic. Small things. Let's just change the diet there. The, re the, the repercussions and ramifications are huge over time, right? Just change the diet. Health issues that other people would have had. Think, you know, and you see this sometimes. You'll see devotees. They then fall upon hard times health-wise, and then they'll reach out to the community. And everyone else is struggling. And because everyone else is struggling, no one's in the position to really help. Then that devotee becomes bitter. I've given my life to this movement. I've, I've sacrificed so much for this movement. Now I'm in a position of need. Nothing. No one came to help me. No one came to see how I am. And they've become bitter. And they may even leave. And when they leave, they'll tell other people about the bad experience that they had in ISKCON. And because they were part of the community, other people are going to believe what they say much, much more. So we have this, and, and that was in the past, right? In the past, if you have a bad experience, people would leave and they'll tell 10 people. That was in the past. Now we have social media. Now someone's bad experience can go viral. Yeah. So it's our foundations. It's the quality of our relationships. It's looking after these things in the mode of goodness. Lift lifestyle in the mode of goodness so that we can continually focus on transcendence and come to the transcendental platform quickly. If we engage in devotional service and modern goodness, you can get to the transcendental platform quick, fast, fast track. Okay, so keeping those things in balance, that's where we're going wrong. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Hare Krishna Mutabhavana, thank you so much. I have a, another question. Um, I have two, so I have to choose one of the two. Okay, I take this one. I experience more and more than people, devotees, don't know their strengths or what they are good in, what they like to do. Mm -hmm. As a result, they are more likely to become unsatisfied and to blame others. How to deal with those people? How to train leaders, especially in ISKCON, to inspire devotees to find and live their dharma? Wonderful. Um, it begins with ourselves. It begins with ourselves. I saw, it's, it's, so, it's so incredible. When you, when you look at the example of Prabhupada, I mean, our founder, Achari, he's, he's a genius. I mean, he's, he's, he's a genius. And, and the more... The more we understand what Prabhupada has done, I mean, the more you see just how incredible he is, how visionary, how perceptive, how insightful, how extraordinary, and, and it's across the board. He's a genius in every single way. Uh, so to answer your question, Prabhupada, first of all, he taught us by his example. We have three things in Kali Yuga. We have three types of, of people in Kali Yuga, unfortunately. We have the human being, 
and that person's rare, okay? Human being, someone who's actually acting as a human, understands the goal of life, is, is sufficiently balanced to make that journey, human being. Second type of person, which we have a lot of in Kali Yuga and in our movement, you have human doing, driven by the mode of passion, running around, running around, running around, not much understanding. And we have the third example also in the world, unfortunately. So from human being, human doing, human undoing. After we burn out, after we, 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 we fall into ignorance, human undoing, right? So human being, mode of goodness, human doing, mode of passion, human undoing, mode of ignorance, right? And now I'm in the state where I'm just helpless, human undoing. So in terms of making the difference, we should start with ourselves. If we, if we live properly, then our life becomes our example. Our life becomes our message. And, and it really does, it is so, it's just so obviously there even in our tradition. What does Krishna say? And he says this twice in the Bhagavad Gita, better to follow your own path than to follow another's path to, because to follow another's path is dangerous. He says it very clearly. It doesn't mean that we don't work together. It doesn't mean we don't collaborate, we don't cooperate, but where you can do things wisely so that you are moving forward in your spiritual life so you have more to give. Read the books properly, serve sincerely, encourage the devotees properly, be an example. One of the simplest things we can do is value the devotees. You see, what happens in our movement is the same thing that happens in the outside world. Everyone will lean towards the recognition. So if I, if, I, if, I, if I see in our communities that the people who distribute books, they're recognized and everyone else doesn't get any appreciation, then there's, two, there's a few different things that can happen. Some people will think, you know what, I, I don't belong here because I can't do that and you only recognize that service. So I can't do that. Or if I do it, I can't distribute as many books as those people. Therefore, I'm inferior. And because I feel inferior, I go away. I think, okay, you, you don't appreciate me. You don't appreciate what I can do. So therefore, let me do nothing. Let me go away. So that's one type of reaction. Another type of reaction is, okay, this is what's appreciated. So I'm gonna, I want to be the, I want the recognition. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sabotage their book distribution. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna find a way to outdo them because I wanna be the best book distributor. I wanna get the recognition. It's all about my recognition. So I'm gonna step on everyone else so that I can be seen as superior so I can get the recognition. So some people will respond in the mode of ignorance. I'm gonna leave, you don't appreciate me. I'm not gonna do anything. I, I would rather not compete then lose the competition. Some people will respond in the mode of passion. Yeah, okay, you wanna have a fight? You wanna see, you wanna, you wanna be like number one? I'm gonna show you I'm even better than you are, mode of passion. Some people respond in the mode of goodness. Okay, I respect and appreciate what you're doing. I respect and appreciate what I can do and I'm gonna make my contribution as well. And everyone doing that will reinforce each other's contribution. So we have to live the example. The days for talking are gone, you know? We have to actually be the example and it will affect the environment. What, what happens in Kali Yuga is that people don't care about the cause, they care about the effect. You can see, telling people the truth, it presupposes, to be really honest, that they're intelligent enough to catch it. That's that, the ability to pick things up from hearing means that there's more sattva. It's actually for people who are more intelligent because they're able to understand something when it manifests on a subtle form. But in Kali Yuga, we're not so smart. So unless you see it, people don't get it. Unless they see you're living a certain way. And by living a certain way, you're, you're experiencing in tremendous advancement in Krishna consciousness. Not only are you experiencing tremendous advancement in Krishna consciousness, your service is really taking off. But it's, but, it's, but it's taking off in a holistic way, not, not in the mode of passion, not just externally, but actually people involved in your, in, with you and your service, they're happy, it's growing, there's depth, there's quality, they're, 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 they're enthusiastic, and the enthusiasm just keeps building and building 
and building and building and it keeps deepening and deepening and deepening. And then they're wondering, hmm, what are you doing differently to me? Right? So people in Kali Yuga, they don't care about the cause because the cause is always subtle and we're not subtle. So we can't pick things up at a very subtle level. We only, we only notice things when things are actually in your face. It's like that health wise, right? Many people, health is, you can see there's some subtle issues in the health. No one notices it. It's only when they've got some big issue, some major health issue, that suddenly, oh, you know what? I need to do something with my health. It's like, dude, I could have told you that two years ago. You were blipping on my radar two years ago. Hmm? So that, that's how we have to do it. We, people, we have, to, we have to live the example. Now, in terms of leadership, every, consider that we're all leaders. Consider that we are all leaders. It, it's a little bit difficult for our leaders in our movement. Because in many cases, the leaders in our movement, they, they, they don't have the same training. This is the second wave. Prabhupada wanted Varnashram College. Why? Because Prabhupada was so clever. He, 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 again, he was just so brilliant. When, when you, you'll see now, right? So now in our movement, sometimes there's different factions. It's because there are certain groups in our movement who feel that they've not been appreciated. So therefore, behind all the different dynamics is actually a call. I'm looking to be appreciated. That would not have become an issue if we'd have done our job properly. Politics, politics is a result, large scale politics. So you always have some political people, but large scale institutional politics is largely a result of people, of groups of people not being appreciated. So, so if they were valued properly, that's a subtle precursor. If I value everyone properly, then you'll see that there's more harmony. And, and this is explained in, um, in various scriptures. Prabhupada talks about Sarva, um, Sarva Sukino Bhavantu. The job of the king or the leader is to make sure everyone is happy. If everyone is appreciated and valued for what they'll do, then the whole movement takes off. And, um, and politics goes down. Why does politics go down? Because if, if I'm appreciated and everyone else is appreciated, I'm not trying to do one-upmanship on other people. Because what I can do is recognize. What they can do is recognize, and we're all family. The day that our movement changes to more of a family model, you'll see Lord Chaitanya's movement, the Sankirtan Yaga, will take over in a way that will blow your mind. It will it not only will it expand the productivity, but the speed of acceleration of devotees' advancement in Krishna consciousness, which people don't know, they don't notice that. It's not just how much people are doing, there's also an acceleration of advancement. And it's very, it's, percep it's perceptible if one knows Nimitta Gyan. You can see, oh, this person's at this stage. Oh, they moved from this stage to this stage pretty quickly. That's really good. They move from this stage. It's a, it's a, it's a darshan. So one can perceive these things by, lash, by lakshana, by symptoms. So not only the, does a movement expand, but the devotees advance faster. But we have to be the example. And then when you're the example, then actually people wonder, how come, you're, how come everyone else is struggling, but you're not struggling? What, what are you doing differently? And then they'll, they'll go backwards from the effect to the cause. That's how it actually works. So we have to be the example. So the first wave was Prabhupada gave the direct teachings about the direct practice. So he really established the devotional practices. Then the second way was meant to be Varnashram, the training of lifestyle to support the goal. Not, not, not that the lifestyle is the goal, but we are concerned about lifestyle to the extent that it supports the goal of transcendence. As much the lifestyle should be arranged in a way that, excuse me, that, that maximizes our ability to do what? To chant the holy names of Krishna. Hmm? Prop, I, 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 I was in Gita Nagari in 2005 and my spiritual master was reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. I can't remember which canto it was, but I found it again recently. I believe it was the seventh canto. And there's also a letter to this effect. Prabhupada makes the point that someone who's too poor can't come to Krishna consciousness. And when I first said it, it shocked me. Like, what, what do you mean? Like, you know, Krishna consciousness is transcendental. It is transcendental. 
but we may not be transcendentally situated. So the point that was being made is, and Prabhupada actually said this also, that he went to one particular place and the people were so poor, Prabhupada said, they, en masse, they won't be able to come to Krishna consciousness. Why? It's analogous to people who are in the hellish realms. In the hellish realms, the suffering is so intense that they can't think of anything else. You know, they're just, because they're just trying to survive. It's just, you know, I just want to survive. And, and therefore the headspace for, for transcendence or to even consider something higher is, is, some, is somewhat compromised. When Prabhupada said simple living and high thinking, what he was actually explaining to us is that there's a trade-off. You see, the more that you live simply, the more that your mind does not have to dwell on everything around you. The more your mind isn't worried, well, how are we going to pay the bills? You know, are we going to get a divorce? You know, are our children going to, going to leave us? Are we going to be kicked out of our home? The mind, the mind is not so disturbed because it's not just functioning on how am I going to survive this situation? And therefore, because the mind is not so disturbed because we have simple living, things are relatively functional. And therefore, the majority of my mental um, capacity can be used in higher thinking. That is to engage and absorb myself in, the, in the, especially direct devotion, Nava Anga Bhakti. So what's happened for many of us, instead of simple living and high thinking, what we do is complex living. Everything is complex. Everything is a lot more work. So therefore I'm having to use my mind to think about right, how am I going to keep the relationship together? How am I going to make sure the kids are okay? How am I going to make sure that I, we can pay the bills? So it's complex living. Therefore, instead of high thinking, the thinking actually goes down. And we see this in the modern society, a very disturbed society. Right? You know, mental health is an issue so much. And it's not just an issue in the outside world. It's an issue in our communities as well. And that has a lot to do with lifestyle and, and being, being affected by the modes of ignorance and passion. So to answer your question, we should have compassion for our leaders. They're doing, oftentimes they're doing the best they can. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just difficult, but we should train. And, and for leaders, they should, don't wait for someone else to train us. Go and train yourself. Go to Folio, go online. What did Prabhupada say about leadership? What did he say about management? What did he say about Raj Rishis? What did he say about kings? What, you know, put them in and look at the principles and start to practice those behaviors. And then that will make a difference. Okay. Any other points? Hare Krishna, Bhutabhavan.